Good afternoon everyone. Thank you for joining us for the next webinar in the series of Bill & Company's Construction Law Updates. This time the subject is a consultant's duty to warn in the construction and engineering field. In our usual format, I would like to start by making some brief introductions. My name is Will Buckby. I am a partner at Beale & Company in the Projects and Contracts team. I am joined by my colleague, Simi Sivapalan, a solicitor in the Projects and Contracts team and Dispute Resolution team. Before we start, I would like to deal with the usual housekeeping items. For those who listen to our webinars regularly, you will know these by now. This webinar is scheduled to last approximately one hour. During the webinar, you can submit questions to us in the appropriate box in the right-hand side of your screen. We will try to deal with these questions during the webinar. In any event, we will circulate all questions and suggested answers afterwards, along with the slides and this recording. We have a good attendance today. Um, if you are able to, please can you mute your microphones. By way of a quick summary of what we aim to run through over the course of the next hour, Simi and I will be speaking about a consultant's duty to warn, and in particular, the following. Firstly, the professional's duty of care. This is important background to our discussion today. This aspect of our talk um, will not contain any surprises, will be relatively short and is just a general recap. Secondly, we will deal with why is a duty to warn relevant to consultants in the construction field? Thirdly, we'll provide a summary of some of the recent case law regarding a consultant's duty to warn, including the recent technology and construction court case of Goldswain and Belltech earlier this year. We hope this element of the webinar will provide some practical case studies for our attendees. Fourthly, we will provide consideration of related obligations such as contractual obligations and duties arising under statute, which uh, in our view may encourage or result in a duty to warn. And finally, we will provide some practical considerations such as the extent of the duty to warn and some conclusions. I would like to add that the reason we have chosen to speak on this subject is because our dispute resolution colleagues, Beale and Company, have recently seen an increase in claims arising out of allegations relating to a consultant failing to exercise his or her duty to warn. So we believe this webinar is very relevant and we hope it will be of use. Over to Simi. Thank you, Will. As Will has mentioned, in discussing a consultant's duty to warn in the construction field, it is very helpful to recap on the general duty of care which typically applies. This is because this duty forms the basis of a professional's duty to warn. A professional will invariably owe contractual obligations to its clients as, as expressed in the terms of the appointment. Ordinarily, a professional's contractual ob obligations to its client extends to agreeing to conduct his services with reasonable skill and care. Similarly, regardless of whether a duty of care is expressly referred to in the appointment, the duty of care imposed on a professional at common law by the tort of negligence and or the Supply of Goods and Services Act is to carry out services with reasonable skill and care. If no express duty of care is incorporated in the appointment, this common law duty will be implied as a term of the appointment. A duty to use reasonable skill and care, in short, means that the consultant must do or not do what an ordinary skilled and competent practitioner in the same profession would have done or not have done in the same circumstances. 
the Bolam case is regularly cited as is regularly cited as being the relevant authority on this. Of course, the standard duty can be expressly overridden by a higher duty of care in a professional services agreement, and this is often the case. Generally, and subject to the terms of the relevant appointment, an architect or a construction professional is under no higher obligation than a duty to take reasonable skill and care in the provision of his services. The Court of Appeal, in the case of Hawkins and Chrysler, confirmed that, that in the absence of any special circumstances and contractual provisions to the contrary, it is not open to the court to extend the normal obligations of a professional beyond the obligation to take reasonable skill and care. However, in circumstances where the professional is highly skilled or qualified, the standard may be more onerous, as was the case in Gloucestershire Health Authority and Torfey, in which the court held that the standard of care to be expected from specialist engineers may be more onerous than general practice engineers. As Will mentioned, this is just a recap and background to today's webinar. So why is the duty to warn relevant to professionals in the construction sector? We think the answer is simple. Construction projects are often made up of a number of parties who take on various roles and responsibilities during the period of the project. Because of professionals' roles in a construction project, they are frequently required to interface with other professionals, designers, the contractor, subcontractors, and of course, the client. Given the interface and work required, it is common for professionals to see things which in turn may assume an obligation to warn. More specifically, consultants' appointments increasingly make professional consultants particularly vulnerable to an obligation to warn. It is becoming increasingly common for consultants' appointment to include general duties of supervision, inspection and monitoring of the contractor and others. These are most likely to lead to a duty to warn. For these reasons, where appropriate, we advise clients to strike out or water down such obligations. Professionals in a construction project may also find themselves under a statutory duty to take action, and this may extend to a duty to warn. For example, obligations in the Construction Design and Management Regulations 2015 and the Health and Safety and at Work Act 1974 may result in a duty to warn of particular issues. We will come on to this later in this webinar. The consequences of not warning could therefore be significant. There are health and safety implications and project delivery implications. For example, faulty work not spotted could need redoing and delay the project. This can all lead to circumstances where an issue should have been identified to a third party and the likelihood of a claim for failing to warn. So the duty to warn is highly relevant to the construction sector. It is fundamental that the scope of one's duty to warn is carefully considered at all times. As would be expected, there is much case law on this subject. However, unfortunately, over the years, the court's opinion of the extent of a duty to warn has differed tremendously and decisions have been made on a case-by-case -case basis. We will touch on this later. Thank you, Simi. Following this background, the general position of a duty to warn at common law is very simple. In England and Wales, under common law, a genuine bystander has no duty to warn. Therefore, if a tourist walks past a building which is about to fall down, extreme I know, there is no obligation to notify, say, the owner of this. On the other hand, there is a general duty on a professional to warn of any danger or problem which arises, of which he ought to be aware and about which he could reasonably be expected to warn the client. For example, 
In the case of investors in industry, commercial properties and South Bedfordshire District Council, the court held that if any danger or problem arises in connection with the work allotted to an architect of ordinary competence of which he ought reasonably to be aware and reasonably could be expected to warn the client, the duty of the architect is to warn the client. So what does this mean? Unfortunately, this is not a straightforward question. The duty to warn will depend on the basis of the specific circumstances of a case and the nature of the professional's duty at that time. However, in short, a duty to warn will arise if the professional ought reasonably to be aware of an issue and could have been expected to warn about that issue. I think recent case law will hopefully support this position. Over the next few, next few slides, I intend to take you through some of the recent cases on duty to warn uh, to illustrate this, but, but also to provide a practical insight as to the extent a duty to, to warn arises in the construction field. The first case to mention is Independent Broadcasting Authority and DMI and BICC a 1980 case. This deals with a straightforward scenario, a consultant's duty to warn where the services relate to something out of the ordinary. In Independent Broadcasting Authority, it was accepted that a design of a cylindrical mast which collapsed after being built was, and I quote, both at and beyond the frontier of professional knowledge at that time. The House of Lords held that the designers should have taken added precautions in order to start discharge their duty of reasonable skill and care in the circumstances given the novel and untried design. In this case, the court held that the designers should have warned the client specifically of what they were doing, the risks arising, and because of the risks, obtained approval. This is something for consultants to note when involved in a novel and untested deliverable. Clearly, a, a duty to warn will exist in, in such circumstances. There has been much case law, as you would expect, dealing with design defects and the extent to which a party to a construction project should have warned of any defects arising. The leading case is perhaps Victoria University of Manchester and Wilson, a 1984 case. Here, the court held that a contractor was obliged to warn the client and his architect of defects in a cladding design as, and again I quote, a term was to be implied in the contract requiring the contractor to warn the architect and client of defects in design which they believed to exist. The court went on to say that belief that there were defects required more than doubt as to the correctness of the design, but less than actual knowledge of errors. So belief of an issue on a construction project is likely to require a duty to warn. This perhaps illustrates that the duty to warn is a wide duty. In plant construction and Clive Adams, a 2000 case, uh, the last bullet on the slide, plant had been retained by its client to install two engine mounts in a research and development centre. Plant subcontracted the substructure works to Clive Adams and these included the provision of temporary works for the underpinning of a roof. During the course of the works the temporary propping installed by the subcontractor failed and the roof collapsed. 
the court held that the subcontractor bore some responsibility as he should have warned the design and build contractor about defects in the design of the roof. The defects in the roof should have been recognised by a competent engineer or contractor. He or she should have had actual knowledge of the defective design. Accordingly, and understandably, actual knowledge um, of an issue such as defective design on a project should result in a duty to warn. In plant construction, the court concluded, I suppose as a helpful summary of the duty to warn, there will usually be an implied contractual term that, that a contractor shall perform a contract using the skill and care of an ordinary competent contractor. The particular circumstances of a contract will determine the scope of that obligation. And where an experienced contractor is involved, the design of the works is not only defective, but obviously dangerous. There is an overwhelmingly case that the contractor is bound as part of its obligation to use appropriate skill and care to warn a client of dangers it perceives. This is helpful in understanding when a duty to warn may arise. A duty to warn can arise out of deficiencies relating to a contractor's performance. In the case of Hart Investments and Fiddler 2006, the court held that even though the structural engineer was employed in relation to the permanent works, he was obliged to warn in respect of an obvious danger with the temporary works when he had seen the excavations without any propping during one of his site visits. As stated on the slide, the judge held that if an engineer employed by an owner in respect of permanent works observes a state of temporary works, which is dangerous and causing immediate peril to permanent works, he is obliged to take such steps as are open to him to remove that danger. It seems to me that that follows partly as a matter of common sense. So the determining factor in, in that case was that there was clear and obvious danger arising out of the temporary works, which the consultant was aware of and should have warned about. Before handing you back to Simi, I would also like to highlight one further case which involves supervision duties of the consultant. In this case, the duty to supervise in the appointment resulted in a duty to warn. In Mackenzie and Potts, this is a 1997 case, the contractor built a house and engaged an architect who agreed to supervise. The floors cracked after the property was purchased and it transpired that the contractor had used some clay backfill um, instead of the usual hardcore. Both the contractor and the architect were sued. The architect had visited the site in accordance with the agreement carrying out its supervision duties. However, the architect had not been there when the contractor had put in the backfill. The architect, unfortunately for him, had accepted the builder's assurance that the appropriate materials had been used. The architect was found jointly liable with the contractor. Even worse, um, the judge found that the architect was 40% liable to the contractor's 60%, largely because of the architect's duty to supervise um, and, and his failure to do so. As we have noted, a duty in your appointment to supervise is likely to lead to a duty to warn. Back to Simi.
the next section of this webinar, I will consider a consultant's duty to warn with particular reference to the recent case of Goldswain and Belltech. To start off, however, it is useful to consider the 1996 judgment in the case of Chesham Properties and Bucknell, in which the court considered whether project managers, architects, engineers and quantity surveyors have a general duty to the employer to advise about actual or potential deficiencies in the performance of the other professionals on the project and provide some helpful guidance in this respect. This case involved allegations by Chesham Properties, the employer, against the members of Chesham's professional team in relation to a simple construction development of a site in London. It is interesting as Chesham alleged that the architects, engineers, quantity surveyors and Bucknell, who were the project managers of the project, each had a duty to advise Chesham of the defic deficiencies of the other advisors' performance of their respective duties. The court considered the particular terms of engagement and held that it would be necessary to imply a term that the project manager had a duty to warn Chesham if other members of the professional team were not performing their respective duties. This was on the basis of an express obligation in the appointment to monitor performance and because of the very nature of the project manager's role. As regards the architect, the court held that it had no duty to report deficiencies in the performance of the project manager as this was not inferred from the scope of services. The architect did, however, have a duty to report any deficiencies in the performance of the structural, structural engineer and quantity surveyor as the architect's REBA scope of services expressly referred to, amongst other things, monitoring obligations. The court held that there was no duty on the structural engineer to report on the performance of the other members as there was no provision for this in the contract or the scope. Similarly, the court also held that there was no duty on the quantity surveyor to report on the performance of the other members. This case highlights the importance of express terms. For example, where monitoring roles exist, a duty to warn is likely to arise. This case is also illustrative of the court's emphasis to deal with cases on a case-by-case -case basis. In the recent case of Goldswain and Beltec, the court considered the circumstances in which a professional engineer has a duty to warn a contractor and or homeowner of any problems with the contractor's performance. This is the most recent decision on a duty to warn and the case is essential reading for construction professionals and consultants alike. Here is a brief summary of the facts. In February 2002, Baltic Limited, a firm of structural engineers, were appointed by Mr and Mrs Goldswain, the claimants in this case, to prepare a design for the excavation and underpinning of the basement of their property in order to create additional accommodation. This included responsibility for the design of permanent works to the property. Beltec did not have a supervisory obligation or a requirement to visit the property once the work was due to start. Mr and Mrs Goldswain later retained Ames, Publing, Pl sorry, Ames Plumbing and Building Services Limited as contractor who carried out the works to the property. Baltic subsequently visited the property on the basis of a separate retainer and aims to inspect the initial pin which was to be constructed. Baltic noticed that the initial pin had not been constructed in accordance with its design and explained its design to Ames. Baltic recommended complete replacement of the initial pin and provided Ames with complete copies of Baltic's drawings. Beltoc did not report the problems to Mr and Mrs Goldswain and did not carry out further inspections. The temporary works were completed in October 2012 but were defective. Mr and Mrs Goldswain noticed cracks appearing in the property and after heavy rain the cracks worsened and the property collapsed on itself. The property was later demolished. 
Mr. and Mrs. Galswain subsequently issued proceedings against Beltect and Ames, claiming for losses arising from the damage. Ames is believed to have become insolvent. Mr. and Mrs. Galswain therefore argued that Beltec failed to exercise the appropriate level of skill and care when designing the basement. Further, Mr. and Mrs. Galswain argued that Beltec were negligent in failing to warn them of Ames's mistakes following the visit to the property in 2012. Before I let you know the court's decision in this matter, it is helpful to highlight the court's summary of a duty to warn. In considering the dispute and the authorities, Lord Justice Corson reached five conclusions. Firstly, the court held that in, in determining whether a duty to warn exists and where a party is contractually retained, it is first necessary to consider the scope of its contractual duties and services. The situation in which a duty to warn can arise and the scope of that duty will depend on what the professional is contractually engaged to do. Secondly, and despite this, the court held that the professional will no, no doubt be obliged to exercise reasonable skill and care. It is therefore possible to view the duty to warn as simply an extension of the duty of a professional to act with the skill and care of a reasonably competent person in that profession. Thirdly, when and to what extent a duty to warn arises will be dependent on all the circumstances. This is perhaps illustrated from the cases Will has discussed. Fourthly and importantly, the key principles as to whether the duty arises is whether there is an obvious and significant danger either to life and limb or to property. However, it can also arise when a careful profession ought to have known of such danger. And finally, on a case where it is alleged that the professional consultant ought to have known of danger, the mere possibility that a contractor may not carry out the works properly is unlikely to create a duty to warn. Something more is needed. This is perhaps a very helpful summary of a duty to warn and as noted is the latest judgment on this issue. So what does this mean for Beltec? The court was satisfi satisfied that by advising Ames to replace the initial pin and correct the method of construction, Beltec had done what a sizable number of engineers in the circumstances would have done. As Beltec did not have a supervisory obligation or a requirement to visit the property once the work was due to start, the court held that Beltec was not negligent and and had exercised reasonable skill and care. Accordingly, the court concluded that Beltec did not have a duty to warn Mr. and Mrs. Goldswain and was not in breach of contract. The court's decision not to extend the duty to warn and be proactive in seeking out defects in the works of other parties will be undoubtedly welcomed by engineers and designers. You will note that again, the extent of the duty was partly determined by whether or not there was, there was an ongoing supervision and monitoring obligation. In this case, there was no such obligations, which is, in, in my view, a contributing factor as to why a duty to warn did not arise. Thank you, Simi. In the remaining slides of this webinar, I propose to speak to you about other areas where, and other reasons why, a duty to warn may arise. As noted at the start of the webinar, a duty to warn or duty to warn type obligations may also arise under statute. We have listed two specific statutes on the slide in, in front of you, that there are likely to be others which may generate a duty to warn. Firstly, the new Construction Design and Management Regulations 2015. As most of you will be aware, these came into force on the 6th of April earlier this year. Um, and amongst other things, 
impose duties on the principal designer on a construction project to ensure so far as practical that the project is carried out without risk to health and safety. Other designers have uh, similar obligations in this respect. Um, this could clearly lead to a duty to warn where, for example, there are health and safety uh, issues which arise. In addition, the regulations include other specific obligations to, in fact, give warning notices in, in certain circumstances. As I mentioned earlier, the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974 um, also creates obligations to warn people about dangers um, in the workplace. Additionally, there may be specific obligations in one's appointment to advise the client of any changes in law, standards or regulations. We see these obligations in appointments. Um, this in effect is a duty to warn type provision, an obligation to highlight any any changes to um, the law standards or regulations which may impact the services. You should uh, be aware of these duties. As has been noted, duties to warn may arise out of the work for which the consultant has contractually promised to provide to its clients or otherwise um, in its uh, appointment or associated documentation. For example, the scope um, of your appointment may include supervision, inspection or monitoring obligations. These are all common phrases which we see in appointments which can lead to a, a duty to warn. Um, by way of example, um, in the case of an architect with an obligation to supervise and inspect on a periodic basis um, as necessary to ensure that the works were executed in accordance with the building contract, uh, a relatively um, common provision. In the case of McGlynn and Walton contractors, uh, this is a 2007 case in the Technology and Construction Court, the court held that it was not good enough to inspect um, simply at, at monthly site meetings. Um, more was needed. Our advice is always that the frequency and duration of um, inspections um, should be proportionate to the nature um, of the works on site. Uh, for example, where there are concerns regarding the work, um, inspections uh, should be increased uh, and, and greater attention provided to the works. Now, unfortunately, this may necessitate in employing additional site staff and if not priced correctly, could involve incurring costs. However, the inspecting professional is not required to look into every matter in, in detail. Um, that's important that wouldn't be proportionate. Nevertheless, once a matter is picked up or identified, um, a danger to property, for example, a particular issue, there will be a duty to take steps to see that the defect is remedied. Um, and, and this might go beyond a simple warning, particularly where the issue is of serious nature. In addition to specific obligations to supervise, inspect, and monitor, um, the terms um, of the appointment may imp impose other obligations leading to a duty to warn. Perhaps the most well known is um, the early warning notice regime included in the NEC3 um, suite of contracts including the engineering construction contract and the professional services contract, um, where there's a mutual obligation on the client um, and consultant or contractor to give an early warning notice where, amongst other things, there will be increases to the prices um, and delay. Um, this is also 
a clause that is commonly amended um, in appointments to widen the scope of the of the early warning notice. So, so um, look out for those provisions if if you are not aware of them already. Deleterious materials um, provisions um, sometimes provide that there will be a duty to warn um, if certain prohibited materials are being um, used or incorporated um, in the works by the contractor or even are being specified um, recommended by other consultants on the project. Um, many architects will um, reject those provisions because it's not their um, it's not their their role to go around checking what the contractor is doing. It's for the contractor to comply with his or her building contract. Um, these these provisions are increasingly common, um, and we usually recommend consultants to to strike these out or water them down. And finally, a duty to warn may arise out of an obligation to comply with other contracts. Um, such as a building contract um, or other third party agreement. Uh, these provisions are relatively common in design and build um, uh, projects whereby the consultant is uh, um, effectively subconsultant to the design and build contractor. An obligation to comply with, with a third party agreement may um, indirectly result in you being required to give a duty to warn and therefore reviewing the building contract or third party agreement and um, you should always bear in mind whether a duty to warn may arise thank you will i'm now going to talk about some practical considerations and draw some conclusions based on the case law and other comments made in this webinar to summarize what we have discussed in principle, any party involved in a construction project may be under a duty to warn. However, due to the nature of its work, a professional consultant is particularly vulnerable to the duty to warn and is often in the firing line. This must be recognized. We advise our clients as a starting point to consider the contractual obligations and the services or works to be provided to determine whether the appointment contains an express duty to warn in relation to certain risks or the obligations lead or encourage such a duty. As we have noted, example obligations include supervision, monitoring or inspection duties. In any event, keep in mind that in many respects, the duty to warn is simply one aspect of the duty of a professional to act with the skill and care of a reasonably comp competent person in that profession. As outlined at the start of this webinar, the obligations to exercise reasonable skill and care means that a duty to warn will arise where a consultant ought to be aware of a particular issue and about which he could reasonably be expected to warn the client or others. The duty is likely to depend on the professional's role and its knowledge. As was set out by the court in Goldswain and Beltec, the mere possibility of a certain event such as danger to property or people, or that a contractor may not carry out the works properly, is unlikely to create a duty to warn. Importantly, however, the likelihood of a court finding a duty to warn increases with the seriousness of the issue or danger in question. For obvious reasons, imminent danger of death or personal injury is more likely to justify a duty to warn than the danger of a damage to a building. However, this, is too, this too will be open to interpretation. A finding of a duty to warn will often arise where there is an obvious and significant risk. So what is sufficient warning? The nature of the warning will of course depend on the specific circumstances of the matter, namely the contract between the parties, the nature of the danger and the circumstances in which the danger is identified. While such factors may seem self-evident, case law has highlighted that in any event, the warning, would have to ha the warning would have had to be overwhelming and plainly effective to absolve it of responsibility. In other words, the warning must be clear. 
In addition, a duty to warn often arises when consultants are faced with client instructions which they are not happy with, and this results in the need of some form of warning. For example, a client may instruct you to carry out a novel or untested design which you may feel could lead to an issue or danger. In such circumstances, you should communicate with the client and advise of any concerns, issues or danger from the outset. It is good practice to record the advice in writing should you need to refer to it at a later stage. And in circumstances where a matter could lead to danger to life and limb or to property, professionals are encouraged to get tough with the client. Finally, as a concluding remark and general comment, if you think you should warn of a particular issue, the chances are you are required to issue a duty to warn. Thank you, Simi. So that is our webinar in relation to a professional's duty to warn in the construction field. We hope it has been useful. Um, if you have any particular queries regarding today or need any assistance in relation to the issues we have discussed, please do not hesitate to contact me or Simi. Um, our details are on the screen. We have received quite a few questions and have answered some of them whilst um, sharing this talk on the webinar. Um, we will respond to the ones we haven't answered separately, if, if you don't mind. Um, as noted at the start, we will circulate a recording of this webinar um, and the slides so that you and your colleagues um, can listen to the webinar at your own leisure. We'll also circulate the, um, the good questions that we've received as well. Um, one, one final point before we, before we end. Uh, if you haven't received an invite already, um, Beal & Company is running a series of M&A webinars over the next few months in association with the ACE and um, our friends at Wilkins Kennedy Corporate Finance. The first webinar is on the 18th of November um, and focuses on the topic of growth strategy. Um, as detailed on, on the screen, it will cover how does a business manage growth, what are the structuring and financing issues, the change in consultant market and, and the pitfalls um, of M&A. Um, that aspect is going to be provided by Nelson, um, the Chief Executive of the ACE. Um, the, the, the webinar will also deal with how to identify the perfect target, how to value a business and potential sources of financing a deal. And um, James Hutchison of Beals will be talking about the legal structure of a corporate deal, the due diligence process, the key legal documentation and protecting the buyer's position. Um, if you'd like to attend, um, please do not hesitate to contact me or send me or uh, email marketing at beal-law.com. Um, so that's it from, from me and Simi. Thank you for listening today. I hope um, the webinar has been of use uh, and goodbye.